Uh, I'm Dom Hayden Davis, Senior Lecturer in Physical Education at Roehampton University. The students today are third years on the BA Primary Education course, but they have a subject specialism in physical education. Today's sessions will be part of the investigating practice module where they are having to think about more than one thing at a time because uh, a lot of them have identified the fact they want to include all children in their lessons but feel that if they're focusing on one child what are they doing with the other ones. We're going to start off by finding out what it was you've done since Wednesday because Wednesday's session was really good, lots of good stuff coming out of it, lots of discussion, debate, thinking going on which is obviously what we want. The session today is going to mainly have three parts. First of all, we talk about what the students have read in between sessions. It's very much a module where they need to be going away reading books, articles about their area they're interested in. So it's very much about them being in control of their own learning. They can bring that back to us and then we discuss it uh, together and they can actually give each other pointers on things that they've read. So they're not all reading all of the journal articles, but they are talking about them and, and becoming more critical of the things that they're reading who's got anything they want to talk to us about that they've come that's found rather exciting, interesting, or just something that's annoyed them from what they've read? Laura. Um, this reading basically sums up everything we were talking about on Wednesday, about the fact that um, teachers don't have enough training with special educational needs, and especially in PE as well. And um, we were talking about just how children feel with special educational needs in PE and their findings indicated that um, they really enjoy PE when they're fully included but um, they feel a bit restricted because of limited teacher training and things like that as well like obviously it's, there's going to be restrictions and um, yeah just um, the Every Child Matters came in um, and about um, LSAs as well and how they aren't trained in PE so their help in PE sometimes is a bit of a hindrance rather than a help, which is a quote from it, not me saying it. Who's, who's had, when they've been teaching PE, who's actually had some LSA or teaching assistant support? No. A couple of you. Sally, was it? It was for one individual child. There's one, so they knew that child, they talked with them in their lesson. What was the, the special need? Um, I can't remember. It was disability. It was some kind of physical disability, but they were there specifically for that. Did anyone have actually just a TA coming generally at all? <clears throat> Okay, so it's a lesson they stayed out from. Hey, Michelle? No, I had a, um, a specific child with a disability. I don't know what the disability or the learning difficulty was, but she could hardly talk, she could hardly balance, things like that. But um, she had one helper that was with her all of the time. But whenever she done my lessons, which was mostly dance, she refused any help whatsoever from the helper. She just went mad and told the helper to go away because she just wanted to do what she wanted to do. So the helper was more of a hindrance than a help. Okay, in that so exactly. What was that, who was that article by? Um, Janine Coates and Philip Vickerman. It's um, the Let Children Have Their Say. If anyone wants a copy of it, I can sort it out at the end. And obviously on Wednesday, lots of swappings of articles and things like that. And it should be that you can come and say, actually, I found a really good one. You need that one. Yeah, I'm not saying copy it off for them. But just let them know where they can get it from. <coughs> okay, who else has read anything the last couple of days? Or something that you read before Wednesday that actually you didn't get a chance to share? Chris? I've read an article about introducing exercise and sport to individuals with autism. It's by a lady called Amanda Durand. But it's a lot of approaches of how, well, how to approach teaching children with autism in physical education. Um, it started off by giving sort of things that you need to think about. So you need to know the needs of the child, what do they like, dislike, their strengths and weaknesses, um, what affects their sensory, sensory system most. Um, and they said another important thing is ask parents and carers because they can often be a good source to find out what, what could be the, the needs of the child. Um, let's, let's stop you there for a second. Who was listening to that thinking, is he talking about autism or is he talking about something else? Hmm? Needing to know because what the children do, children. talking yeah. about the parent, things like that. Okay. So a lot of the stuff you're going to read in the specific stuff about autism, the things like that, are things that you should be drawing across for all the other children within it, be it special needs or gifted and talented work or different things like that. Okay. So make those connections between things, and as I've said before, make those connections between what you're doing in PE and what you're doing in maths, English and all the other subjects as well. So you can start to get an all-round picture of those children.
So Chris has taken on his reading. Who, who didn't share one last week? Who wasn't here? Because Alex, you're looking more at gender and boys dance and things like that. Have you actually managed to find any readings particularly on that? I have, but it's... Were they any good, those readings? Everything I've read is, it doesn't seem to focus specifically on that. They all seem to link back into, into like teaching styles and that kind of thing. So rather than it being how to engage boys in dance, it's more about just engaging the learner full stop, which is probably where it's going to end up anyway, because it's, it's like the same with Sen, isn't it? Yeah. It's just all about every individual is different rather than groups of people and assuming that that group of per people are going to be any different than any other group. I suppose if you're looking at like sort of personal, personalised learning, then it, that covers all aspects. Anyway. What might be some of the things in, in boys' dance that might limit them? You know, if we haven't got the readings to back it up, what have been our experiences? We found, if we've been teaching dance that boys don't enjoy it, or have we found the opposite? I found the opposite with mine. When I was teaching the year sixes um, last year, I taught dance and I did um, it specifically to the Olympics. So they were talking about, we were talking about football and other sort of sports that boys tend to be more interested in to link it into dance to get their interest um, into the dance rather than them thinking that it's just a girls thing because when I first said dance they just <laughs> their faces they just really didn't want to do it and then as soon as I mentioned that they were going to be playing with footballs and things as well the boys came up with some brilliant results and the, their dances were really good. Okay challenge for you with the person next to you I want you to think about what I'm about to say we shouldn't think about special educational needs or gifted and talented in PE because we should be thinking just about individual children so we shouldn't target any support beyond the individual child. One minute, with the person next to you. Should we target or should we not target? If they are, it's not necessarily targeting a particular group of people, just targeting each individual child. So it's like, what aspect are you actually targeting? So you still have to then give it down to the individual. Okay, who wants to respond? Um, we were just saying that if we were aiming to teach um, personalised learning and meeting the needs of everyone anyway, then we shouldn't have to label children as special educational needs and gifted and talented because our personalised learning would adapt for all of them anyway. Okay, anyone have a different view than that? If you've got a group of, say, 30 children and your task is to deliver 30 specifically tailored lessons, that's a bit of an almighty task, isn't it? <laughs> no, but it's is not it? 30 specifically tailored lessons. It's one lesson that incorporates everyone's level of ability. So give me an example of how you do it for, I don't know, pick a task and, and how you do that. You pick a task. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, so me on the spot. Let's take, let's take, um... Oh, God, really <laughs> sweat down. Dance, what? Maybe dance. Dance, right, so you, you will take dance and we'll take one specific... Just practice. ...learning, I don't know. Okay, so you're saying dance, um, what's the...? Um, rotations. How? So, like, and let's say you've got somebody, I don't know, so you've got 30 different children of all different abilities, and... First of all, you would make them experiment with different rotations and different travel paths and give them key ideas on how to rotate or turn or move mm -hmm. in a particular way, and then base it from that, from what they can do, and then build upon from what they can do. How do you do that with each individual child? Well, it's going to be... It's the, you're going to have groups of people in, in the end that can do particular things and that kind of go together. Well, so it's for you to kind of... No, but it's you to find the links between those individual children for them to be able to work together. But then that's grouping them, that's not personalised. That's like saying you've got those ability groups, you've got, right, those can do that, they can do that. I don't know, finding the links between them. Not saying that necessarily you, you all can do the same exact move, but your move complements that move, that goes into that move kind of thing and base it from that. So it's taking their initial thoughts and building upon that. It's taking the idea that you want to include all children at their own individual levels, but taking the, the realistic point of view that actually is looking at 
commonalities between them and perhaps within part of a session you're going to more favour one type of learning need whereas later on in that session or the following week in a different lesson you're going to focus more on the other children so it's not just saying actually in one session I can cover everyone's needs because that's going to be nearly impractical but it's saying across their experience, their learning experience you need to make sure you are planning that all of them can achieve in the different ways that they can so it's, it's not easy, and that's the, what, almost what you're looking through in this module is the, the rhetoric is that we should be achieving this, we should be getting all children included, but what's your reality of experience as you move through those kind of things? And you've got the whole like inclusion can exclude as well that we were talking about on Wednesday yeah. and how the child can feel excluded because they've been given something different to the whole class. So, mm. Do you know I like activities that are sort of like sort of differentiated by outcome rather than within the task itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So rather than saying, oh, you're going to work on this equipment, which then for might label them as higher ability or lower ability, which I think is a bit bonkers. But if you do it so they choose their own stuff and it's sort of differentiated by outcome, then I think it's just yeah. going to be more inclusive anyway. Differentiating by themselves. So you give them a choice of equipment and they can choose what they would like to work with because they know that they can work with that. And then it's their own choice, not yours. Okay. When I was training, a lecturer said to me, lots of different types of differentiation. The most popular were teachers of differentiation by outcome. They then described that as just being lazy because you're basically saying, I'm doing the task, the children will do something. Do we agree? Do we disagree? Because you've got to consider the input you give throughout the lesson. That's going to be the most important part. If you leave children to differentiate it by sort of accessing an activity in different levels for their own ability, then your input's going to be really important throughout the lesson. So you're not just sitting back and going, carry on. You're kind of thinking about the questioning you'll ask and things like that. Right, Kirsty, you were looking at classroom environments and how that can be moved into the hall. Have you, have you managed to find any readings on that yet? Um, I was looking at the magazine, but I've not yet found anything about the environment and using the hall and displays and stuff. Has anyone put any displays up in their halls while they've been on practice? Yeah, no. no. Some have, some haven't. Who, who has? And, um, did it work? Did it, was it helpful? I had um, sort of words or um, action cards and pictures because they were doing mini beast movements and things, but they didn't seem to pay much attention to them. They, weren't, they were reception, so it was... But I think because they weren't used to having anything on the walls, they just were in concentrate more on moving. And that's going to be part of this thing, if you try something new and the children really aren't ready for it, it's, you know, sometimes it can backfire and be even worse than it was to start off with. Chris, yours is one that interests me greatly because you're looking at actually what you need to do as a teacher to access more support. So working with the, the, sort of, uh, the support systems within the school, getting to actually teach. Do you think in the school you're going to be placed at, you're actually going to get those opportunities? Um, I hope so, in the, looking at their model and what they do for their teachers and how the coordinator look, um, develops himself as well as as a support for other teachers. Okay, so you've looked on the website, there's a good model of support in there already, so hopefully you'll be welcomed into that as a student teacher and, and to move yourself along there. Who's actually found that their school has got a particular speciality with a particular type of need or a particular area they focus on? Michelle, you oh, not that I focus on, no, but they have a, um, a language unit, a specialised language unit, so I'm guessing that a lot of the students and parents and stuff have English as an additional language. So that Which could be... What Amy's going to become an expert on. So it is, yes, yeah, hopefully. The second part of this session, we're actually going to set them a challenge where they have to plan an activity where they are having to think about more than one thing at a time. So they've got to think about how they're going to teach their small group of children an engaging, fun, learning activity, but also how they're going to focus on their particular area of interest, which might be a special educational need, or it may be a particular teaching approach they want to use. What we're going to focus on now, and when we go into the hall, actually builds scarily well on what you've come up with already today. Because in reality, what we're asking you to do is to teach your 30 children their learning objective in a developmental way, so you're building on their, their strengths rather than what they can't do. 
but we also want you to focus on your project. So we want you to focus on developing support for AL children or assessment or motivation or climate or different things like that. So you're going to have to have two things in your mind at one time. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to set you a challenge this afternoon. Okay? You're going to basically be in charge of your own learning. Okay? You are going to have to decide who you're going to work with and what you're going to do within the framework I'm going to give you. Okay? So. We can pass those round. This is what we're going to be up to. Just take 30 seconds to have a read through. Realise the enormity of it. And then we'll talk it through. Questions? <laughs> When it says six learning activities, does that mean under the one like curriculum area within peace or like under dance or under? You've got your learning intention. Okay. What's the learning intention? Someone share it with me. To develop awareness and understanding of key movement concepts, space direction, level and pathway. Okay, so that's what the children will need to learn. How you deliver it, what vehicle you use, i.e. gym, dance, games, yeah. is down to you and what you think is going to be best for the group you're planning for. Now, there are six of them, and you're going to be in six groups. So you're each only going to actually plan one activity. Now, you need to know which groups you're going to be in. And that's where it gets a little confusing, because you don't get to choose automatically. You've actually got to decide who you think shares some links with you. So just like you were saying, and that's why I said it was scary, you were saying that you, know, you need to find some commonality. You've all got different projects, and although some of you I know two of you are looking at gifted and talented. There are others of you who have some links to other people. So the six groups you could join are assessing children's understanding, developing yourself as a teacher, adapting teaching approaches, developing children's communication skills, developing social skills, and extending or challenging children. So those are the six areas. Some of you will be thinking, yep, I know exactly who I need to be working with. Some of you will be thinking, yeah, I think I've got an idea. And some of you may be thinking, which group am I going to go in? Mm -hmm. okay. You all know roughly what each other's topics are. So when we do go through the, to the hall, you should be saying, actually, I think I'm with you. Because I think we share something common in what we're looking at. I think there are probably two or three of you in each group. Okay, so if you find yourself on your own, you might need to look around and go, either they don't like me, or <laughs> I think they should be with me. Okay? So that will lay out your task to you again. So the information will be in there. Now, the biggest challenge is the fact that you want them to be able to do this learning activity without you there. Because I know you're already good at coming up with really fun, engaging activities for children. But you've also now got to come up with some way of giving them the instructions and giving them methods of getting feedback without you being there. So essentially these children need to come to your activity, look at it, look at whatever you've created and understand what they have to do and learn and understand if they're doing it well. Because as we said, if you're dealing with 30 children and you want to focus on a particular group, that means the others have to be somewhere else so that they can be learning. So that's probably the bigger challenge, Michelle. What age group are the children? Can anyone tell Michelle that? Does it say on between five and eight? Between five and eight. That's a big range, though. It is a big range. Yeah. But you'll note there are 17 of them, there are 17 of you. So I've modelled it on your ages. Oh, okay. <laughs> so five to eight, because it's not the really young ones, but similarly it's not the really old ones, so it's a bit of a mixture there for you. Now, once you're in your groups, you've got some negotiating to do, because we're not having you fighting over equipment or stimuli. So in these envelopes are some different types of stimulus or different types of equipment. You're going to randomly choose which ones you get and which space in the hall you use. If you get one and you think there's no way I can possibly use that in this, you have to find someone who's willing to swap with you. <laughs> because again that's the reality of being in school. You might want to do a really good lesson involving all of the footballs and things like that but someone else has got them. So can you negotiate with them? Can you think of a better way of doing it? Okay, so there are some fairly varied things in there. 
Okay? Try and be as creative as you can to work these things through. Okay? So we can go into the hall, we're going to get ourselves ready to work. We're going to get into our groups, whoever you think you should be working with. You're going to come and randomly choose your equipment. And then basically you're going to have about a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes to actually plan your activity and get it ready and any resources you need as well. Okay? We've got pens and paper in there, we've got crayons in there. If you need some other kind of resource, access to the internet or something like that, come and ask me, you can go and do it. But this is about you controlling your own learning. I'm there as a, an additional resource. So if you need ideas or something like that, bounce them off me. But other than that, I'm not inputting at all. Okay? So it's about you doing your things. After that 20 minutes, there's another envelope you're going to get. But I'm not going to tell you what that is yet. But you just have to have it at the back of your mind that something else is going to happen. Okay? Any final questions before we head in there? No? Okay. Let's go through. So, do we think we know who we're going to be working with? Yes. yes. Okay, so who thinks they're going to be working on extending and challenging children? When we set the challenge and the task, we've decided to do it in quite a novel way in terms of handing them out as envelopes. Part of this is because we want the students actually to take some responsibility for their own learning and actually trying to say, well, which of these areas, which group should I be working in to make the most of this session? Because they're third year students, next year they're going to be teachers, they're going to be on their own, so they need to be able to make decisions for themselves. But also we want to add an element of, yes, fun, yes, challenge, but also the fact that as primary teachers they're going to really have to think on their feet. So throwing in something they're not expecting or perhaps hadn't wanted gives them that element of actually having to be quite creative and spontaneous. Now for your stimulus. As you can see, lots of the little equipment out. You've got access to the cupboard. We've got some books down here. We've got some musical instruments. We've got crayons. We've got drawings, different things you might need. Come and get it. He's not got one yet? Oh. Oh, okay, you. so <laughs> you've got them into your group, <laughs> negotiate if you need to, and see how you can go. So you've got 15 minutes. When they open the envelope, the first challenge is their main task, where they actually have to plan an activity, they get their learning outcome, and they get their focus of the session but they also find out that they've got to imagine that the children will be there without them as their input so they can't rely on their voice or instructions to do it so they have to think about how they can draw or write different things that the children can understand so that they can be sure of what they have to do in the task what they want to learn but also how the children are actually going to know they're successful without the teacher telling them um, without us saying right you need to do this you need to do that and then we need to think how they're going to assess those as well. yeah so they how, can assess themselves. Got feedback, right? yeah. So self assessment. Right, okay. So what we're gonna do with um, smaller friends is like tables and benches and stuff. And it's gotta do with space direction and level and path So they could have different ways of travelling. Along a long long bench. And they can follow each other partly. You could have like a course of a couple of tables and a bench. Yeah. So but then that's the different levels. levels. And then yeah. you've got the direction and the pathway. Because it's five to eight year olds, so they might not remember what is for what. So shall I the stimulus change? Yeah. Uh. And then maybe. Ooh. Yeah, so as the instruments change, they'll be doing a different concept, so that'll be reinforcing the concept each time they do it. And then, what I was going to think, something else, I don't know, a different instrument for them to maybe focus on a particular skill, maybe a balance, so maybe we could do like a two-point balance or three-point balance. So if they're struggling with language and we've got language yeah. barriers in terms of that, what else can we use other than words? Diagrams, Draw, yeah. pictures, Diagrams, that's pictures. Halfway and again, to that's where you've got, books. and then you've all got, you've got to think of is how do they know if they've done that well? Because um, yeah. obviously you're not necessarily there to yeah. give you that feedback because you might be helping other groups around. Okay. So, I wouldn't go through all of the books, but choose a few you think actually it's got those pathways, it's got those levels in, and then think how can you convey that to them in a simple way. 
So we need to like bring it round this way and then have the question there. So that way? Yeah. Yeah, like if we go out a bit more and round, and then they've got further to go, don't they? Yeah, maybe we have cones and then we're showing the, the, that they're going round. Yeah, because it's basically like, they're, at least they're starting and then they've got to design their own pathway through the rest of the course. Okay, so they've got that creativity in it as well. Yeah. That's the aim anyway. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> going to get some equipment out so they could be looking at the levels that like going over or under and things but to get the, so the fish is more going to be going under things yeah. obviously the frogs will going, yeah. going over things. the storybook activity was designed for those children who have problems with speech and language or perhaps don't speak english so very much focusing on communication skills and then we could on our piece of paper put it in different languages of can you be a character Okay, in yeah, so, or even just a picture, because probably five to eight-year-olds, if you just put a picture of a frog... They know, yeah, they they've know. got the books out, they know okay. gonna... Yeah, they'll start bonging around you, they've got the language of the boing and different things like that, so even if they can't read the whole text, yeah. they've got those key, the key stimulus to what they're going to do, and, um, you know, as you say, if you have different bits of equipment to help you, it just makes it more, more dynamic as they move through. Yeah. You can just draw them, just trace them out, um, even if it's just a basic, you know, sort of... Um, so Squiggly line, so different things. So. so where do you want to change direction over? Yeah, if we put that by that obstacle over there, then we need to write this one here about the create your own pathway, and then we need like an end point, don't we? Yeah, we have a finish point. You've got about one, two minutes left. Do we think we're going to be ready for that? No loud no, so two minutes and we get the next envelope. So we're going with the three main So you're going with those there. three. You've got your characters, you've got your instructions. Yeah. And you're got not the far from being ready to go. Yeah, you can do, explore the different levels with the, like knees, crawling, tiptoes. With the partner helping them. Yeah. Because of the social side of it. Yeah, so the social part is the fact that they're working in partners and then it can extend it further with the blindfold. Yeah. And, and it's then, also developing communication skills yeah. as well. Yeah, because they need to give them clear instructions yeah. so they yeah. don't fall off. Yeah. We need to put somewhere that you need to support yeah, I'm your partner, right. hold their hands. So the blindfold activity was about developing social skills. Now you need to turn right. Okay, so now you're about to walk onto a bench that's on the same level. Keep going. Bring slightly. your that's it. right foot, that's it. Keep going. That's it. Okay, now turn Stop. right. Stop, turn right. Turn foot up, right foot up. Stop. Bring this foot towards you as well. That's it. And then step, step down onto the soft play further, that's it. There we go. <laughs> okay, and step step down, yeah. the bench. One person from each group needs to come and get their next challenge. Read it, weep, Cry. talk to your group, and then you've got about 10 minutes to try the rest of it. The second envelope is more setting the second task where actually they finish their own activity but they have to go around and critique everyone else's so they have to think well do i understand what they've asked me to do are their instructions clear enough but also would children understand these or would the children with particular needs understand these written instructions or these pictures okay then it says change direction which way are we going that way so you could go backwards <laughs> then you make your own path. Here you go. You. You've got your little thing. Um, one thing from the activity, you need to know 
the children need to know the vocabulary, like up and down and turn left, turn right. Yeah, before. so they can help each other. Yeah, because communication for this activity is the probably key learning to it. How would a monkey go along that? Because the snake didn't work overly well, but how might the monkey yeah. use that one? How would a monkey do it? I got roots going around but actually instruments you almost want to be there to actually play it and, yeah. and get that stimulus themselves otherwise you're relying on one of the children doing that as well so you've probably got the more difficult task it's not that you can't include every child but mm. there are only some bits that actually it's very difficult too I told you not to put that middle envelope and you ah. at the end of the session we tend to sit down and, and basically review what we do so we'll look at what they found easy about the task, but also what were some of the challenges. And it's, it's probably more important to focus on what the challenges are because we need them to be thinking about, well, if they are actually doing these kind of tasks with children, how are they going to overcome these problems? Once we've got our um, like starting point, so once we, once we realise we're going to use the book as a sort of starting point for the learning intention, everything just fell into like, place. Yeah, so if you get a good stimulus, Things just roll on from each other and books are really, really good for actually getting ideas from. What other, what other things did you find easy and straightforward? Setting our, acti our, our activity wasn't too hard, it was just trying to develop it more towards what our focus was. Because we, we did it and then suddenly realised that it's got to be put towards our, ours was social skills and we'd made it and then thought actually you know, how do we adapt this now towards a social skills kind of theme. So. And, and that's, that's the nub of it really in the terms that a lot of the plans that you'll get or a lot of the things you'll think, oh we're doing a particular activity, it's really easy to say I can think of a hundred different ways of doing that really interesting, engaging, fun, but then you think actually hang on, I've got these children I need to think about, I've got this that I need to think about, how am I going to do that, that what makes it a bit more, more difficult and it's sometimes you need to actually almost forget the activity and say well here are the children I'm working with, what do they need to be able to achieve this learning outcome? And then the activity almost hopefully will create itself rather than saying, here's my great fun activity, oh, I've got to. Flipping around, actually starting with the children in the first place. What were the other difficulties about that task? Um, just so that, obviously not doing everything in command style, so, so that children know what they're doing without you having to give them instructions all the time. We're very reliant on the fact that we can use our voice to tell children what to do. And the challenge was today, could you do it without yourself really? You know, can you actually get the student to do things independently? And for some of you, you came up with pictures, diagrams, arrows, drawings, the whole world's hieroglyphics in some cases. Did you find those useful when you were going around trying other people's activities? Yeah, some of it yes, other bits it's a bit confusing. I think the, the jungle animal, the first group I was with, we said, lovely picture of animals, we're going on a jungle journey. Where? <laughs> okay. So we actually drew a map, because there's some lovely equipment out. We actually drew a map and said, these, these hill bits are the mountains and this is a, a bridge. So it added to the story, and then we felt it made a bit more sense. Because um, otherwise you're sort of, well, I can see the picture, I can be a penguin, or Jenny can be a penguin. But wh where am I going to be a penguin is, is a difficulty. What other problems did you come up sort of specific to your, your areas you're working on? Well, with like our one, you said you didn't really know where to go. We didn't want um, the children to have a set, a set path. So we didn't want them to act like a snake just on the floor. Like they could have acted like a snake on the bar. So we didn't want to kind of make a set yep. route for them. We wanted them to make it up themselves. So then they were being creative. And also then you haven't got that worry of, they've missed the start point. I think when the groups first came over, it was, oh, they've missed where we've written start. They've started somewhere else. So it is the problem. If you're not there to give those instructions, you've got to really think about what you're doing. The group that did the, the book activity said something interesting. They said, that, you know, we, we were thinking, you know, if some of these children are native Spanish speakers or things like that, 
I can't speak Spanish, I can't translate it here and now. So actually a lot of that preparatory work is going to have to happen before you come in. And I think that's the key thing with if you really want your, your PE teaching to be good and inclusive, you've got to be prepared to put the preparation in. Because in, in other subjects you do, in English and maths you do, but in PE quite often teachers say, well, was Sarah's work, you know, your, your project's going to be, they pick up the lesson plan and say, here's what I do. You can't then go back during the session and say, well, but hang on, what about these children that I need to support? Yeah. So it, it gives you a bit more evidence for your, your line of thinking there as well, because you've practically tried and it takes time to do those kind of things. Ben, Michelle, I know you, you, you found yours tough. You found yours tough. Tell us a bit about that. Um, we had instruments and, yeah, they were... <laughs> We had the idea, but we didn't know how to use the instruments to help our idea along. Like, we knew what we wanted to do and how we wanted them to do it, but then it was how do we put the instruments into those ideas? Because if we could tell them what to do and what to use them for, but we wanted them to do discovery, and then if we just left them to it, we might have ten kids banging, mm. you know, bongos or something, and then it'd just all be crazy. And that, you know, that's another key thing that's, you know, I made you have instruments. Well, you chose them, but I made, I made them come into it. Ben chose it. But sometimes you might have a new piece of equipment or a piece of equipment that you think, actually, I really want to use that. But actually, it doesn't work because of the, the children you're teaching or the style of teaching. So sometimes you do actually say, yeah, we've got some, but actually that's not going to work in this setting. And sometimes that does happen in schools where you get you know, your different vouchers and things like that to actually say, oh, we've got some great new equipment, let's use them. And then once the novelty wears off, you realise actually it's, it's more trouble than it's worth. Why don't we get different equipment that children can actually use? It's when we were doing that activity, like, we read what we were supposed to do and then incorporating the, the instrument in it seemed to detract from the P of it. It seemed to, like, be all a bit mixed up. Definitely. It does, that's, yeah. that's the problem that we had. It's like, what are we going to do with the instruments? We don't want... And as soon as children see instruments, the first thing they're going to do is... Yeah. So we didn't want that to happen. And then it's all about what, the what are the instruments used for? Are they going to be used to give the children directions? Are they just going to be playing the instruments so that other children can dance along with it? And, yeah, <laughs> decisions, decisions. It felt like we were just using them for the sake of using them in the end. Yeah. yeah. Because we had them. We had an idea, but we, then we just had a box of instruments to use. We just felt like we were using them because we had to, in a way. The activity could have easily been done without instruments, with even just music or even no music. So. And it's, you know, in P, it's very easy to, look, you know, to be blown away by the space, by the different things that are available. But the key things you've got to stick to are who are the children you're working with and what do you actually want them to learn. And if you stick to those two, you won't get carried away with, well, this looks fun, this looks colourful, this looks bright, this looks new. You can actually say, well, actually, I don't need instruments. We can, we can learn this, these children can get it a better way. The other thing we had was, what are we assessing? Are you assessing the skill or are you assessing the concept? So, yeah, we just fought back and forth between that activity. So not a straightforward one. That's fine. OK, we're coming to the end. Um, I think it's been quite worthwhile. Hopefully you've got a bit out of it and it'll help you think about when you're in school, how are you going to overcome some of these problems? And obviously you're not going to be, you're not going to just be given 15 minutes to do it and you're not going to have some idiot coming up with an envelope halfway through saying, there you are, there's another challenge. But you might have someone coming up and saying, you're in the middle of your planning, I need you to come and have a meeting. Or someone's fallen over in the playground, can you come and deal with this? So you do need to be able to deal with things as you go along as well. Right. Before we go, we're going to have to pack up, <laughs> make sure it's all neat and tidy, and I'll see you next week. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully the students will take away some positives, but also some, some things to think about, because it shouldn't all be about them leaving thinking, I've learned something to do. It should be about them thinking, well, actually, perhaps I've found a problem that I need to go away and read some more about or try some different things off. So hopefully they will go away understanding a few of the problems of including different people, but also going away thinking, actually, I need to do a bit more reading. I need to keep learning so they don't think they're the finished article.